Today we're going to talk with James Folds. James has got lots of information on different things, but he's going to start out by talking uh, about the Red Rock Mill and his time there, maybe some of the names and the, that the mill went by. Okay. Um, as Flanna said, I'm James Folds, and uh, at the present time I'm a citizen of Nipigon, and I'm uh, sitting on council. Uh, to talk about the Domtar Mill, which uh, people have referred to it in a number of different ways. Uh, it started out as uh, Brompton, then it went to St. Lawrence Company, then Domtar bought it in 63. I started working uh, with Domtar in uh, 1974, and uh, I actually worked in the mill as a summer student prior to that. And when I finished uh, college out of Toronto, I took electronics, but the only way you could get into the mill was actually just to start what they call in the labor pool. So I went back to working on the paper machines and at that time uh, there was two paper machines. One made newsprint and one made liner board, which is brown paper for making cardboard boxes. Um, I worked on the paper machines uh, for about a year and then an apprenticeship came up in the instrument department, which uh, wasn't really in the line of my schooling, but uh, instrumentation was going from uh, uh, pneumatics and air-driven motors to uh, electronics, so they felt that it would be a good fit for me. Mm. So anyway, I, I started my apprenticeship in uh, 1976, and it was kind of a funny story as to how I got in there, because I actually was working in uh, the instrument department in the summer of uh, 75 and uh, uh, for about a six month period and the uh, the mill actually went on strike in 75 so I thought well geez am I gonna quit the mill or should I stick it out so I actually stuck out the strike which was a long strike I think it lasted five five to six months uh, the only strike that ever happened in Domtar and uh, at the end of that uh, Roger Harvey, who was the paper machine superintendent, phoned me up and he said, Folds, report to the paper machines. And I uh, got the call at home and I thought about it and I said, no, I'm not going to report. I'll go look for a job someplace else and use my, my education. And uh, about uh, an hour later, John Freeman phoned me, who was the superintendent of the mechanical department. He said, Folds, report to the instrument shop. So anyway, that's how I started my trade in instrumentation was a call oh. from John Freeman. I did my uh, apprenticeship uh, under Donnie Rojo, who's probably, uh, he was a citizen of Nipigon as well, and his dad, and uh, his grandfather actually lived in Nipigon, so, and uh, I, he taught me all the ins and outs of uh, pneumatic instrumentation and controls and mechanical leverage and all that, and then I did an, uh, my further apprenticeship under Gary Lang in electronics and uh, computerization of the paper machines, so. About how many people, can you remember, James might have worked there when you started in the 70s? Uh, in the 70s, there was probably about 700 people still working there. Uh, wow. Because the, the whole process of, uh, there was lots of changes there. And I'll just fast forward because in uh, about the newsprint machine and the liner machine during my period of time in the 70s was doing quite well. And actually, they were, they were gearing up and they were actually doing a lot of work to the newsprint machine and the ground wood, which was to produce the pulp for the news mach machine. They were actually doing a lot of upgrades. And um, in 1989, they actually had a new winder coming in and they were going to do some more upgrades to the newsprint operation. So and, uh, the, by the end of 1989, the newsprint market collapsed. And they had all this gear in place for rebuilding the binder and so on. And uh, uh, they struggled through that. They didn't make any more investments in the newsprint uh, operations. They still ran it. But in 1992, they actually had to shut down the newsprint machine, which was right, uh, um, it was pretty bad for a lot of people. And was that have, sort of the first downsizing? That was the first downsizing. So. Uh, the history of me um, prior to that, in about 1988, uh, the union president of Local 528 asked me to uh, sit on a committee that was uh, working uh, to, because the company wanted to amalgamate the electrical department and the instrument department. They wanted to blend them together. 
and they were two separate unions, but uh, the president at that time and the first vice, they didn't know anything about the instrumentation trade, so they actually uh, uh, asked me to sit on a committee. And then I became a shop steward while I was working on the committee, and uh, then I actually, they wanted me to move up to what they called second vice president. So I was in second vice president not more than six months, and then they, in 92, they announced that the newsprint machine was going to go down. And our local, it actually affected probably 200 employees mm -hmm. through the mechanical department, the groundwood department. The whole wood room was shut down. And uh, in uh, the other local, 255, it would have affected about 60 paper makers. So in that process, the president of our local and uh, the first vice both lost their jobs. So I became president of the union in 1992 when 300 uh, uh, pulp and sulfite members were going to lose their jobs. So we had to go through a major downsizing. It was a life learning experience for me dealing wow. with people losing their jobs and re redoing contract language. But um, it would have been worse uh, had the uh, Bob Snow was the paper machine superintendent at that time. And he asked permission of Domtar and uh, the mill if he could try to make liner board on a newsprint machine. And they actually gave him permission to do it. And uh, at the end of the day, they were running fire hoses from uh, the pulp tanks on down to the machine and everything. So there's fire, fire hoses running all over the place. And uh, mm -hmm. he was su successful in actually making a sheet of paper. It wasn't high quality, but he could make it. And uh, the corporation decided that it would be a good fit to try to make liner board on that machine. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, <clears throat> they made a, a light grade liner, which was uh, which they also made on the the heavy the, the bigger machine. Uh, which is called 127 gram, and that kept that machine going for quite a while. But uh, I don't know what liner board was used for. Well, liner board is for making boxes for um, uh, cereal refrigerators. Oh, we, like oh big oh. big boxes. Yeah, oh. refrigerators. So there's different weights of paper. So they made what they made is a 337 gram, which they called 69 pound weight, which is a heavy paper, oh. or a 26 gram or 127 gram or 26 pound weight, which is a light paper. So they would make that either for grocery bags or for uh, oh. uh, beer boxes, uh, even little boxes, they could make it, anything out of that. We didn't make the boxes, we just right. made the paper, right? right? And cool. Domtar had box plants down in Toronto, so they always made the boxes in the high populated areas because they could distribute it quicker. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, that machine, number one, was converted and it was made into uh, uh, they added dryer cans so they could make more paper and they ended up making a light, lightweight liner and also bag paper. And we all know today that machine, if it was still running, it could still be running and be actually quite profitable because with Amazon and Wayfair, which right. is the new wave everybody is buying online now, everything is shipped in yeah. boxes. And now that we're getting pl rid of plastic bags, everybody's going to paper. Yeah. So. Red Rock actually made paper and boxes. And so it just goes to show you how things turn. Now there is a market for that because I, I know a fellow, the, one of the HR guys in uh, Amazon, and they're looking for a paper mill. Oh. Would they ever build a paper mill in this area? Absolutely not. It, it's just uh, the environmental assessments and all those things that are associated with it and uh, the amount of dollars that have to go into it. Uh, oh. is un, un, you can't do it. So then. It, Anyway, it was very successful from uh, from about 93. They made more investments into the mill. They, they made investments into the both machines. Uh, it ran well. And then all of a sudden we got into 2003, 2004. And uh, the market started tightening up. The dollar started going up because we relied on a, a low dollar, low Canadian dollar compared to the U.S. dollar. And as it increased, then... Uh, it uh, it played a big part in our operation. So, at the, in 2006, uh, they they came and announced that they were going to have an indefinite shutdown on the paper machines right. and the mill, and then they shut the mill down in 2006. But oh. ours wasn't the only mill. <coughs> no, ours wasn't the only we mill. We were one of many. In yeah, that it was era, right across right. the country. Right. So, and probably at some point in time, they probably should have taken 
down some males because there, uh, there was probably too many males. But uh, if I think if they would have done that, um, uh, there would be more males running in this area and there would also be sawmills running in this area because that's the fit between making paper, running a pulp mill or a paper mill is the sawmills okay. because that's where all the uh, fiber comes from. Right. You know, right. So they get the best of all the products. Now they don't have the, the end user of the material. So putting a sawmill in sometimes doesn't benefit because they can't get rid of the sawdust and chips, right? Oh, so, right, so right. there's a whole catch as a, a process, and and I have my own thoughts on it. 2006, uh, it was not a permanent shutdown; it was an indefinite shutdown. I spent 2007 trying to uh, work with the government and uh, the mill operations to see if we could get the mill back up and running. Unsuccessful. 2007, I ran for the NDP because Howard Hampton came into yes, <laughs> the car dealership yeah. and asked me, he says, I hear you're trying to get the mill running. And I said, yeah, I'm trying to. And he said, uh, he says, who's listening to you? And I said, nobody. Then he said, you might as well come with me and we'll campaign based on that. And that's why I ran with Howard Hampton right. in 2007. So, But that changed everybody's life between that and the sure. mill burning down, eh? Everybody yeah. in town changed everybody. And right across the North Shore, I think. Oh, yeah. Everybody's life yeah. changed. Yeah. I, I think every, a lot of people took uh, those operations for granted. And yeah. that's one thing I've learned. Don't take anything for granted. You know, if you have something, you should try to keep it. Work the best you can at improving it or working right. with the people that make the investments. Because people make investments uh, for a reason. And they want to turn a profit right. like any business. And people should accept the fact that people have to be profitable to, be, right. to keep us in a good job. Right. And I think the biggest thing, it's not so much the, the wages. I think people really realize in losing benefits yeah. and pensions, those yeah. those were really difficult. Anyway, I spent after that, I, I did more jobs uh, after I lost my job of 32 years, uh, bouncing around and still in the instrumentation, but I tried selling cars, which was a bad idea. <laughs> when I go and buy a car now, I just buy it. I don't <laughs> negotiate because I know what it feels like. Right. So. Yeah. But you, you were saying people were comfortable with that because, I mean, when my boys were young, you automatically worked there for a summer and you automatically didn't go back to school and yeah. you got hired, eh? That's right. And everybody sort of expected, a lot of men especially, expected to get a job in the mill yeah. because it was there. So it served a lot of people yeah. over the years. It did. It really did, yeah. And while it was here, like... It gave us a good life. It, we, had, we had a good life. And I mean, uh, the other things I was part of was the curling club. And during the 80s and 90s, it was a booming place. Uh, right. We had lots of fun. Uh, I think uh, we had... At men's bond spills, there was 48 teams at a bond spill. The ladies' bond spills was 40. Because I even remember when you were talking unions, they gave a lot of money yep. to a lot of causes, the oh, unions, yeah. didn't they? Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes, we yes, actually, the local 528, actually, in the hospital, we took on a room. So they, they always want to refurbish rooms. And we said, right. we'll just take on the responsibility of the room. If you need anything within that room, you can buy chairs painting, anything like right. that, uh, we always make contributions to that. So, yes. yeah, they were always in, in needs, like the fall fishing festival, right. all the unions always supported it. So it was, uh, right. it, it was good in, in that regard, so, and. Okay, is that a good time to wind up then, for that one? Sure. Yeah, just about the mill, good. Okay, we're gonna talk, continue talking with James, and he's going to talk about the curling, which is one of his passions uh, in Nibigan. Yeah. Did curl. you curl in Red Rock, James? Oh yeah, I curled in Red Rock. Uh, I started when I was uh, probably 13 years old. Oh, okay. And like most people around here that got involved in curling somehow, uh, I got involved because my dad curled. Oh, right. And then he got us into the Domtar Bond Spill. Because oh. Domtar used to have a big bond spill every spring and it was, uh, you can invite the whole family and my dad used to bring us in as kids and we loved it. And uh. then I asked him, can I curl in the uh, men's league with you? I think I was, I might have been, 15 then or 14 and he took me on way back then and and, and curling so uh, uh -huh. so I always loved curling and uh, uh, it was a passion of mine actually the whole family our whole family were, were curlers so so when I married my wife Helen I had to make the big move from Red Rock to Nip again and uh, uh, I got involved in curling in the uh, uh, the old Nip again curling club which is uh, now down where our recycle plant is eh? but uh, Curling was growing. People were excited to try it. I think there was a lot of younger people around that uh, yeah, knew about it and they were anxious to try it. And and people had a good time 
curling. It was, I'd say curling in the older days might have been a little bit more serious and, it, and it progressively got uh, to be um, more of an entertainment for people to get out and gather and have a, some good parties in that day. So. Did you ever know any history about how this one got built? Uh, well, I was around when it just started getting built, so I, I know the old club, I, I remember there was three draws in the men's side and I curled some nights to go down at 10 o'clock at night to curl in the third draw. And I was curling with Andy Scabar and Paul Baxter and Johnny Scabar and uh, Joe, uh, Joe, uh, Joby Gentile at one time even. So, but uh, the other, I, so anyway, the new one got, got built because the old, uh, the old one was in really rough shape. And it's, I, I don't know if it got condemned, but uh, they felt that it should be built. And it was the curling club members that uh, the town gave the property to the t curling club members, and the curling club members actually raised the money to build that okay. new club. There was, there was grant money, obviously, but they had to come up with a, a portion themselves. And the curling club members actually signed a loan from the bank to actually build that. And during my, when I was president in the uh, 80s, yeah, I was president for about five years in the 80s, um, we actually, they paid off that mortgage, uh, in, I think it was in the 90s, but they actually had a mortgage burning uh, ceremony where we right. had a big party and uh, there was, uh, I mean, Cassidy's and uh, Yorakis and uh, Bartlett's, uh, uh, they were all mortgage holders on at Stocco's. Right. And uh, there was quite a number of people that that held that mortgage and backed that mortgage. So, but the Curling Club in seven, w w was built in '76 or it might have been '75 and started curling in '76. But um, there was a lot of excitement around that being built, right. and a lot of new curlers came on board then. So, at, at the peak of the t uh, time, like because uh, it was very competitive, TV wasn't what it was nowadays. People didn't sit around and try to right. move the aerials around to find a channel to get out and they go play hockey or they go down and curl. So the, the league's really built. Uh, the men's league especially went to three nights a week. You know, they had up to uh, 24 teams in the men's league. Wow. Women's league was 18 teams, you know, bouncing around there. So, um, but with that number of people and uh, Thunder Bay was no different. The whole North, North Shore was the same thing. There was big leagues. We had lots of our bond spills and our bond spills were were uh, filled to capacity and always growing. And like I said, we had uh, the men's ball and spill at its peak and it was 48 teams. And that's all we could take. There's more that would want to come, but we could only take 48 teams. We'd start on a Wednesday night. Wow. And then the ladies actually grew up to 40. And uh, some of the, the ladies' bond spills were a lot more fun than the men's bond spills. We, we had a ball there, so. Uh, I have lots of pictures of them in costumes oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah, and that's what that these, these binders the are, are. Some of them are, are people that have uh, dressed up. And, yeah, and uh, these are actually binders from our playdowns because uh, the provincial playdowns, the first time we hosted one was in 1984, and this is the provincial mixed playdowns. And the provincial mixed, or any provincial playdown, had never been played in a small town. They always went uh -huh. to the big centers. So uh, when I was president, uh, we knew this was coming up. We went to a meeting in Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay wanted it, uh, but we made our, our good push. And Nipigon was growing then, and, and the bond spills actually helped us out. And so in 1984, uh, Thunder Bay, or the executive, uh, allocated this uh, 1984 provincial mixed bond spill to Nipigon. Hold that up and just open that one, yeah. James. And, the, and these are, you know, go back to 1984, these are all ha handmade uh, um, uh, handouts that we gave to the curlers and Chick McCabe did all, most of the work on them. You know, and it's, it's not, uh, uh, not like this one in 1989, we actually, because we were so successful in 84 with the play downs, in 1989 we actually went to a printer to make our, our brochures to hand out on that. But there's still a lot of involvement by people and you can see the, the committee people that were there and we made, um, you know, we decorated. We did a lot of work in, in, in getting things involved, but that just created more excitement in town for people to get involved in the curling club. So, and you know, it's uh, lots of volunteers must have been needed when oh, you had that. Because oh yeah, that's a lot of people that sure. came to town. Sure, every time we we hosted one of these, is uh, 
I'd say there was probably close to 100 people volunteering between uh, umpiring and drivers, uh, drivers and, and everybody had fun. And, uh, you know, when we got uh, the males involved again, like uh, uh, Domtar at that time, they, they had the show, uh, Quebec Lodge and they opened that up for all the curlers. They hosted the supper, Township of Nipigan hosted the supper, you know, so they're, uh, they're exciting times and I think when you have that and you get people to come out and see what, what takes place in that atmosphere, it's, uh, it, it was good. And then uh, since that, that time we grew and Nipigan became known as a, uh, a perfect host in curling. We seemed to be able to organize well. Uh, we got a Ava Walters, got awards uh, for um, uh, being involved in curling. Uh, they gave me an award for uh, curling and uh, organizational. It came from the Curling Association. So we, we are noted that. So every time we made application for uh, playdowns, provincial level playdowns, it, um, it, they seem to accept and say, yes, we're going to dip against noted for that. Let's, let's go down there. And of course, we had Lloyd Stansel. Lloyd Stansel was the ice maker in uh, Red Rock, and we asked him to come over because he was he was a good ice maker. Right. He did go to a, a couple of, I don't think at that time he had gone to Briars yet, but he wanted to get down to a Briar. So we asked him to come and help us make ice for this provincial mix play down. So first one we were hosting, we wanted it perfect and everything. And he agreed to come over and help us. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we did, we got a, a burner to burn the ice and it get all the float the dirt to the top and then you could vacuum it off and uh, the night before the playdowns were supposed to start he went and burned the ice and it was propane burners and one of the igniters didn't light up and he put liquid propane into the ice and when it was finished and it froze all the ice was marbled together and we went down there and we looked at it and he, we all said it looks terrible and he didn't know what to do so what he did he scraped it off and he reflooded that night. And the morning, the the playdowns were supposed to start the next evening. And the, the the morning before that, I went down there. I thought I was getting up early. Got down there at seven o'clock to go see what it looked like after the flood. Lloyd was already down there at five o'clock in the morning, scraping the ice. And he was going home. And he says everything's perfect. It turned out well. Wow. So it was a good story. So then Lloyd Stansel actually went from this to helping us with our eight, 1989, but in that period of time, he ended up uh, getting accepted to be part of the Briar right. team to make yeah. ice. And then he also was the head of the um, Scotties uh, nationally. He was making ice at the Scotties as right. well. So uh, this this actually promoted, helped promote Lloyd Stansel even into right. his ice making career and getting more involved with people. But running those curling clubs, just to, so you know, when I was president, even though we had big memberships and everything, it was expensive to operate. Uh, they used to always laugh at me because we had electric heat in that place. And I used to run around, the ladies would sit by the windows and turn up the, the knobs on the electric heaters to warm their feet. And I'd go around and I'd turn them down because I looked at the electric bill. And we paid taxes back then. We were paying $20,000 a year back in those days in taxes. And then the taxes were dropped down. Uh, lower uh, and then uh, eventually we had to ask for forgiveness on taxes because we couldn't afford it, but we maintained all the operations uh, but uh, like anything electricity was going up and it just got more expensive to operate so it it's uh, and, you know any any facility uh, is expensive to operate yeah. so we did learn that you know and it's uh, the membership actually did well to uh, do as well as we did to maintain the overall cost of operations of that. So having Alan Hector come from here too must have been a real boon oh, for, yeah. for Dipping and Curling Club. Well, well, sure, and Alan's actually in some of these pictures for the Scotties. Every time we had a Scotties or a playdowns, we'd always invite Al to come down That's and right. throw the first rock in that. But I, sure, Heather Houston and Al Hackner, and Al, yeah. both going to the Worlds and uh, winning the Worlds, uh, I mean, that boosts Curling right. in this whole region, right? So, right. so if you could, if you knew Al Hackner or Heather Houston were playing in the Bonds Bowl, everybody wanted to go you there, go. right? Right. Yeah. Just to watch them, if nothing else. Right. If they didn't, if they got to play against them, they, which was great. just a couple of years ago, two people sure. were came out to watch. Sure. Alan go. and Al's still playing. You know, yeah. He's a little bit younger than I am by an inch, and uh, he can still throw a rock ten times as better than I can. So, <laughs> yeah. But those are, I'm just thinking when you were saying that, because Lloyd and Heather and Alan were really well known yeah. everywhere. Right out for, through the region, yeah, yeah for the for, for the curling expertise. Curling. And like, look at Al Hackner, he's gone and uh, coached the U.S. women's team, and he's coached uh, 
you know, the Scottish team. So, and same as Rick Lang on the Thunder Bay. Right. But uh, they're big names, and it's. Right. I, I hope we can get back to that. You know, the yeah. the competitive curling is one thing, but this was all social curlers. And uh, the whole thing about curling is just getting out in there and enjoying the game and right. then going into the club room and having a drink and enjoying each other, you know. So, right. Yeah, Helen was just telling me last night that she was curling and, and she talked about, uh, I think it was 96 when they had the big snowstorm because they were talking about Newfoundland being snowed in. Right. And uh, she said that it was a Red Rock Ladies Bond spill and they got that snowstorm on a Thursday night and Nippy and ladies were supposed to curl in Red Rock. And they couldn't get the teams out of Nipigan to go to Red Rock. So what Red Rock did, they actually reorganized the schedule. So all the Nipigan teams played Nipigan okay. in Nipigan, and all the Red Rock teams played Red Rock in Red Rock. And Helen tells me, she couldn't drive out of the yard. She walked and had to crawl over snowbanks to get out of the yard, walked down the streets, and everybody played their game. So, you know, nothing stopped people from curling, curling. back in those days. Right. Not even a... You didn't need uh, to call in the military to shovel the, the, right. the sidewalks or anything. So, they, and they, she went last night, and they they talked about those good old days oh. and had a good time. So, yes, that's good because. Uh, and how long uh, maybe um, James was the youth involved? Because when you first started, I don't think yeah. children were, really no. went to the curling club. Not not other than my kids being in the basement. That's where we right. They, yeah, they, they grew had to up be in the, the basement. basement. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they grew up in the basement there, right? So then, uh, yeah, but I think it was more into the 90s. I think Cassidy's uh, were quite Cass involved yeah, with, with bringing the youth Yeah, to Cassidy's curl. came in, and uh, I know Alan Ovid, and I know uh, the Bingomans, uh, right. they got involved in it, and, uh, and, and I mean, it's still going today. They, right. I mean, they're trying to, kids are interested in curling. Yeah. Like once you get them down there, the Little Rocks uh, helped uh to get them started but most of them wanted to throw a big rock anyhow of course and uh i mean even last year i was in with my my granddaughters helen and i and christopher and my three granddaughters were in in the the funds bill they had last year so right. i think youth is, is interested there's so much for kids to do nowadays eh? but uh my my claim to fame is still that uh, the, like the dom tar bonds bill or having those fun spills where people can actually it's not competitive, just come out right. and try it, and that gets people kind of in the door, kind of gets them interested. And I think the plywood mill, I remember oh, that. Yeah, they they got anybody in their family to come and be on a sure. team. As long as you had one person connected to the plywood mill, yeah. you could um, go and curl. And people, that would be the only time all year they would yeah. curl. So Nipigan yeah. right now is lucky. We, we still have our curling club, and uh, I think it's working well. Uh, like Helen said, the men's teams are nine teams this year which is really good, and the ladies are actually at seven, but there's enough ladies on the spare board that they probably can make another team. Oh, okay. So uh, Nip Nipigan's hanging in there, and thanks to the township of uh, Nipigan and uh, reorganization and that, and because we, we look at um, you know any type of sports activity for anybody as a part of the community, and without those, what do you have, right. right? So you have to have that. So it's a new era now with Krabby Andy's taking over. Yeah over the club room there yeah. and it's a whole new outlook it's, on, yeah. on curling. And too. I think it's a good change. You yeah. know, it's it's good because people, uh, you know, when you get stagnant, then people will lose interest. So you change it up a little bit right. there and people, and a new group. What right. it's brought in, it's actually brought in, uh, Helen was telling me all the teams, and I'd say five out of those seven teams for sure are all young. All that middle-aged, right. you know, people that have kids and that, that you want, you want it down. The so maybe level. people who even come to Krabby Andy's get a look at what Curly is sure. too, because yeah. they can watch it. So yeah. Yeah. You get, yeah, a different opinion. Yeah. So it's a whole new thing. So, and, uh, so to me that, that was, uh, Curling was a big part of this community at one time. And, uh, and there was lots of people being involved, like Jimmy Rockies, uh, uh, that were a big part of it. Dennis Cassidy, John Chase, right. remember when they were, they were fundraising for that curling club. Right. It's between they had a, a walkathon, a ten, yep. ten kilometer walk, and they had to get pledges and that. I had that out on Lake Helen because I have a yeah. picture of Margaret Summerlee and Margaret Banning. It was to Polly okay. Lake and back. Yeah, Polly. And uh, Jimmy Rocky got the most uh, sponsorships because nobody thought that he'd he'd walk, walk the whole thing, and he did. <laughs> so that's how they raised money. So and they had fun doing it. And we, when we actually had to repaint and uh, do work into the curling club, there was always a, a work party. Right. And at the end of it, you had a spaghetti supper or something like that. And, but, uh, 
And I don't so, even want to talk about the lady sponsor bills in the old Elks Hall. <laughs> <laughs> is there any records though, James, of the first curling club? Like, how long has curling been in Ipigan? I don't think I've ever heard anybody say. Yeah, I, I don't know that either because yeah. that's before my time, right? I, so I remember Stan Gordon being very involved in that in that first curling club. I okay. can remember his his yeah. group of people being there. I have pictures of those people, but yeah. I can remember he was a very ardent curler yeah. and uh, and very involved in it. But I often wonder if that's something we don't have history of yeah. is is when curling first started. Yeah, like the, this is the history that I have like right. for curling and when that new building was built and, and who was involved and, uh, and what we did right. during that period of time. Eh? So it's been going a long time yeah. anyway. So like when my time. son became a hockey player at the age of 10, Helen and I didn't know a thing about it because we're curlers, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, but. And it is nice that there is that option because hockey is the main thing yeah. for kids and yet curling is interesting. The kids do like to curl. Oh, yeah. And it, it's, it's, a good, it's a good alternative. Yeah. And it's a life skill. It's a life skill. Yeah. Hockey isn't always a life skill, but curling is, yeah. right? Yeah. And well, hockey has a different, because I was... Just say my my son went through competitive hockey. He actually ended up playing out of Thunder Bay on the on the uh, AAA Bantam team and the AAA Midget team up there. He played with the likes of Patrick Sharp, who went to the NHL, Alex Ald, who went to the NHL. Um, I forget the other. There's about three of them that all went to the NHL. We're all in that Bantam team. But out of that, Billy ended up in Junior A in Winkler, Manitoba. He played there for three years. He got a scholarship. He went to Manhattanville College. And he graduated there with a marketing degree. He worked in marketing for a while, but he always wanted to be a police officer. And they actually came after him. They actually oh. knew, police officers knew him. They asked him if he would be involved in it. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So is that what he is now? He's a police officer in Thunder Bay. In Thunder Bay. Uh, eight How years. I didn't know that? He's actually in the detective department. They oh, moved him off into a detective. So, but those skills from hockey is why they actually came right. after him. Leadership skills and team team. Uh, Homer Bilal spoke young Homer at um, a, a hockey banquet, and that was what he told the kids. It's not what you do on the ice sometimes; it's all the other things yeah. that you do yeah. that make your character. Yeah, Billy should actually come down and talk to those kids again yes. because you know they they all want to go to the NHL. You know, they all think they're going to make yeah. it, and he actually went through all the ranks and played with guys that made it to the NHL, and he was in that caliber. Right. Never did, but his and an expectations were not to make the NHL, but to to play with those in that competitive league. Right. And he got a scholarship. He was actually drafted by the OHL, and he never, he never took it. He went to Junior A instead. So your boys and and uh, daughter, do they curl? Oh yeah, yeah. And even Billy curls. He's oh. a good curler, but he loves hockey. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> good. Thanks, James, for talking okay. about curling. Okay. So now we're going to continue talking to James because he's wearing the hat of. Um, being on the fishing festival committee, fall fishing, fall fishing festival. festival. So when you, I can't remember now, was it just Nipigon Fall Fishing Festival Legion was already out of it <clears throat> when you started? Uh, that was the transition point. <clears throat> it was uh, the Legion wanted out, I forget how many years they, they had been involved in it and, and operating the fall fishing festival. So what year were you talking then? Uh, I think it was around 89. Okay, so that was about 25 years that 25 it had years. been with yeah. the Legion. Then. Yeah. yeah, that's what I think. It was yeah. right around that 25-year yeah. okay. mark. And uh, so anyway, we had, this kind of stems out of the curling club, but uh, we were sitting having a beer one night in the curling club, and the festival was um, the membership, or the, uh, the people organizing it, the committee, they were getting tired like any committee, and they wanted to, somebody else to take it on or, or not do it anymore. So... There was myself and Larry O'Neill and uh, Scott Ronaldson and uh, a couple others who we were sitting at a table having a beer. And, and we knew as a curling club we had to fundraise money. So we thought this would be a great opportunity. So we went over and approached uh, the committee and said that, uh, you know, we, we are considering uh, being involved in it. I don't think we wanted to take the whole responsibility over. But uh, we said if we can get other organizations in the community to be involved, that we would be part of it. So then uh, I'm pretty sure Don Dorian, I remember him being at a meeting. Uh, the Legion may have called a meeting and of groups and organizations to come together to see who would want to take it on. And um, we did, and the, the Elks Hall came forward, and the Snowmobile Club back in those days. So 
Uh, so we took it on, and the person that actually ran the first one that I was on, her name was Anne McEwen, and she was an OPP officer, but she was involved in the Snowmobile Club. Right. So yeah. um, there was myself and Larry O'Neill uh, got involved, and Scott Ronaldson from our side, and the Elks was uh, uh, Norman Saracen and uh, Jack Hamilton, and I think there was and, um, Marcy Nichols. Was there no Legion people who stayed on? Uh, I, I can't remember anybody okay, from the I'm Legion really staying on. Okay. And I, I thought that Dawn was around a little bit there, but most people that were on that committee were tired. And, right. uh, yeah. and where I am now, I can understand that. You know, well, you just kind of get go numb, yeah. you know, to do yeah. things. So, so you know, and uh, I, th I can't even remember. I think the first couple that we did were inside the old arena. And then the arena got condemned. And uh, that might have been around in the early, I think 1990, that's when that went down. I remember that we had the fishing festival and then Celeste called me two days later. She says, I didn't want you to have the news before the festival weekend, yeah. but here's the news that it's been condemned. condemned. I can remember that. Yeah. And, yeah, just like it was yesterday. Yeah, and then yeah. we actually ran two festivals that I can remember outside. Right. So the, the arena was down and out and they were in the process of building the, the new one, right. but we didn't let the festival die. So right. we had, uh, out in the parking lot, we had tra trailers and tents and whatever, and, and we, we kept it going that way. We had the, the dance still at the Legion, and the dance was still going well at that time. Uh, and uh, we actually even a couple times barricaded uh, Zachner's Park. parking lot and yeah. uh, the overflow would go out into the parking lot of that. So And the one time was both halls. I remember people walking back and forth between the Elks yes, and the Legion. Yes, and Elks and the Legion. And yeah. Because there was two dances going yeah. on almost. So, yeah. so we tried lots Persevered. of things. Persevered. Yeah. And uh, I mean Anne McEwen was here probably for her three, four years. And like In those days OPP used to uh, move around a little bit more and and then uh, I think uh, it was either myself or I think it was Larry O'Neill first that took on the, the chair of it. And then uh, uh, the arena got built, uh, we went back into the arena and uh, we tried a lot of different things. The only problem with the arena, the big dance that they used to have, uh, there weren't as many people around even in the 90s that wanted to go to this big dance and everything became cumbersome. We did run some uh, big dances there. But uh, it, 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 it wasn't the numbers that it used to be. And, and I sound, think I was saying to you too that, that the booths became too sophisticated yeah, to take down. Take down. Take, and put up, take down, take up. Yeah. And so people didn't really want to do that. Yeah, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a big part I of it too, so. yeah. Right. And you know, I mean a vendor like if you have like nowadays, he brings down all his uh, um, thrift stuff. Oh, that, I mean, that, the that, fellow that, that comes from Thunder yeah, Bay. That yeah, that guy would take for half a day just to set up so right. you can't tear it down. But right. the, the sound system in the new arena, and even to today, is terrible. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, that was always a frustrating thing yeah. for for us as a committee as to uh, people like entertainment, but as soon as you put music into it, or if you have to talk to somebody on a speaker that doesn't work well, and it, it's not you don't feel comfortable up there on the stage. Right. And some people's voices carry better than others, so it's, yeah. uh, it was difficult. But yeah. I mean, I, I think that the festival was then and still is very good for the town. People are excited to, to have it and be able to get back into the community to, to, to meet friends that they knew when they were right. younger or, or yeah. even people within the community. It's a gathering right. point where people can actually get out of their house, go down, have something to eat and meet people all, all right. the rest of it is just to me it's just bonus right, right? so right. so I've always enjoyed that aspect of, of the festival keeping it going just to, for the for the community itself so right. and kudos to the um, CWL because they still are the original they've been there <laughs> the, pie, the longest the everybody else has changed but <laughs> yeah. that they have been constant since since the very beginning yeah. uh, they still have their pie booth yeah. down there. So just maybe mention then a little bit about how the fishing's changed, James. Oh, the fishing itself changed immensely because at one time you used to catch the fish and hang the fish all day and, and they would catch all species. Uh, so there was at some point in time there were people, even the committee looked at it, right, and said uh, we, we can't be doing that, you know, because there's more conservation being here. We don't want to spoil fish and uh, uh, we still like the part where people that never 
get to go fishing or have never seen a big salmon and yeah. that that they have that opportunity to see something eh? but we went into um, changing the concept that it used to be a luck of the draw so that you could actually just catch fish and, and if you we'd clip a pin and then you get a, a little slip and you would put them in the boxes and then we just have draws at the end of the day and I'd say most uh, fishermen didn't mind that concept we had uh, big money but it was it was still kind of a luck of a draw and some people are, that were skilled fishermen still wanted that biggest fish. chance to go and catch the biggest fish and all that so so what we did is then we salmon became um, more abundant within the, the Nipigon River system and a lot of people were catching them and they were some good sizes so we we introduced a thousand dollars for the largest salmon so we used to give out three prizes largest salmon was a thousand then 500 for a second and 250 for the third and and that that worked really well for about five years and then uh, all of a sudden then one guy three years in a row won the big the thousand dollars and then people started saying well is he catching it or is he isn't I, I think he caught it. he was just a, a good fisherman right, right. He, he knew where to go so then we thought okay well we better change that up again and uh, we took the thousand dollars out right because it, it was maybe it was the money that was it but uh, we try to organize um, the, the salmon is still there it's a big part of it but um, we try to organize the other uh, species of fish through lake trout we took the speckled trout all, all together we reintroduced it people didn't like that when we reintroduced it took it back out again so so the speckled trout will I don't think will ever go back into it Right. Yeah, yeah. Even though the speckled trout is probably the most abundant fish out in the right. lake that I see right now, because right. it's really uh, come back thanks to the likes of Rob Swainson's and that, and the programs the M and R put in place. So, right. yeah. For people who who didn't know though, those first years, they would have a mystery weight, and it would be picked out by the bank yeah. manager, and it would be <clears throat> stored at the bank, and it would not be revealed until the weigh-in time. Yeah. And I can remember those times happening yeah. i can remember dave banning especially would be drawing it out they'd be putting it in an envelope so that nobody knew yeah. and it, it was a whole different yeah. uh, type of thing yeah and the m and r were involved a lot in the weigh-ins yes in those early days and they would take samples and that yes. so that they knew yes. how the species were doing and then they stepped away from it and then we had to get volunteers to right. to do that cleaning right. of that and then then when we took it over into the luck of the draw, which I guess wouldn't be much different than having the, the mystery the, weight, the mystery weight yeah. you know, so yeah. uh, in some way. So, and I know that when that mystery weight was there, those really good fishermen, they would bring in a fish and uh, all the way yes, through so that they the would through. have that range of yeah. fish eh, so they got good. Yeah. And yeah. well, I mean, in a change too, I think you used to be able to buy uh, in the original one you used to be able to buy a ticket that right day yep. and enter a fish and you can enter as many fish as you want right. whereas ours are limited to, uh, it was a $25 ticket you had to buy it before the derby even started mm -hmm. and then you had to actually there's only so many fish that you could catch you know mm -hmm. in that well Bill Locker would be one of those that would be sitting on a table at a table every day selling all those tickets right yeah. up to the last minute yeah. because it also got you in the draw yeah. um, at the same time but you could you're right about entering a number of fish yeah so yes. I, I think the fish the fish the people are getting away from the fish it, it's there but the number of fishermen have really gone down except for the huck fin the huck right. fin is still well over a right. hundred uh, kids go there right. so it's just fun getting out and and we've adjusted the uh, the actual uh, festival fishing festival so that you're only adult fishing two days and then you can take your son or daughter or grandchildren right. out fishing right. on the third day so try to get more family involvement so but uh, you know that to me a big part of this is the parade and the parade was always big in the the the, the good old days before right. we took it over uh, the atmosphere in the community was always great people in the bank used to get dressed up seconders you know the, all uh, son, they all got dressed up in some type of uh, fishing gear or whatever and I I like to see they, they, right now with the younger generation getting involved in the parade and I think the last two years we've had really good parades yes, the last one yeah, was really yeah, good. really good and I'd like to see uh, um, you know the uh, businesses just getting a little bit involved a little more because the number of people that show up on the parade yeah. route still to watch a parade is just uh, 
it, it's and unbelievable. It's, it's I, too I, bad it costs so much to bring people from Thunder Bay too, because yeah. th that was always a big part of the parade. Sure. Or the drum majorettes, or the Legion Corps from Thunder Bay, yeah. or the bagpipers, and yeah. the pipes still come down, which we're very lucky. Yeah, like because they're a big part of the parade. Yes. And the Shriners with their little cars. And we got but, the Shriners back. They never uh, came yeah. for a while. Uh, yeah. yeah. But some of the other ones aren't. Our organizations aren't even. They don't even exist That's anymore. That's right. So it's That's trying right. to make the up. Clown for, band. I don't think. No, you never hear of that anymore, and that yeah. was a very popular one too. Yeah. So. so, so, but I, I think the the just the kids being involved in it, you know, and making right. the floats, and that's what people want to see, and and that, and last year by us being successful in getting the, uh, uh, the, rides. the rides back, you know, the midway back here really brought more to it, um, and if they can continue on with that, I think we'll still have one, one of the more active festivals. So, right. I mean, it's whatever number of years we've been now 50 some odd years so I think when I got the we got the 50 I started saying you know I think that's enough for me and uh, when but I your became, dad was involved because your horseshoes. dad did the horseshoes all yep. the time yep. right a big part of it and they tried horseshoes again last year yes they on, did on try the that. field there but uh, yep. that was always a popular event sure. was the horseshoes yeah yeah it was a big part and, of it uh, but, uh, Ted okay. used to win it all the time. Yes. Ted, Ted, yeah. and, Ted uh, Martin was Ted it? Martin, yeah. yeah he could throw it. Sure. My, him and my dad used to be real competitors there, right? Yeah. yeah. My dad used to tell me stories when they had camps on Ishka Bibble. They used to play horseshoes at night. And he said they used to put a candle on top of the pig. And I said, well, you must have knocked that candle off. He says, no, we threw ringers all the time. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh. So, yeah, it was very popular. So th and things have changed. Even the ball has changed. Yeah, on from it. the original ball that yeah, took place in the ball. fishing festival down to the slow yeah. pitch. It's a very big part yeah. of the festival as well. So. Yeah, but it, it's. Uh, I mean, the number of softball or slow ball pitchers or yeah. whatever we call it nowadays is. Yeah. Uh, it's still up there. Yeah. I mean, they and, still come down. And then look at all the food booths are outside now. Yeah. Who would ever dreamt of that a few years ago? Yeah. You would never have thought that you would be outside, yeah. mainly because of the cooking facilities now. Yeah. yeah. But but to be outside was a was a real change. Big, big, it's a big yeah. change. Like I mean, but you have to adapt the change. Yeah. You know, you have yeah. to accept it, and uh, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that we're we're fortunate that we have still youth in our community. It's unfortunate that fifty percent of our youth. 50% of the population is over 55, right. which, right. you know, because so then we are always trying to get uh, people involved in, uh, you know, your organizations to try to keep it going, eh? And but the last two years you've had new young people come yeah, oh yeah. offering for the fishing festival, that, which... That's why I say, that's why it's, it's really good because the, the entertainment they bring in, the young people, the parade is being right. operated by the young people, so... Yeah. As long as they stay involved and they, they have that enthusiasm to do it, right. I think the, the citizens benefit from that, right? right? That's what it's all about. And that's why I always try to promote that. I mean, it's not a community unless you have involvement by right. people. And not everybody can get involved. Right. Uh, and some people just uh, don't have the ability to do it. And lots of people are flying out. They still live here, but they fly out to their jobs or they have to, or they're yeah. only home for a week or they're, you know, and it's, it's a d difficult. So you, you try to do the best you can. But uh, I just know I don't want to sit on another committee. I'm just <laughs> myself. <laughs> You're looking for a change now, too, are you? Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm starting to get tired. Well, I'm on the hospital board. I'm on now. I'm on this LCC. Right. I'm on DSAV. You know, and it, and council meetings. Right. And, and then whatever subcommittees. It's housing. All and, the subcommittees. Yeah, right. And the subcommittees. Right. And after a while, Helen says, "Aren't, aren't you retired?" Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, but I. I, I to me, as a counselor, uh, I hope the festival goes for another, as long as this town's alive, right. because I think it's it's needed. And if it's not a festival, it has to be something. Right. You have to get people right. to gather, and people love gathering. I yeah. mean, the Christmas train, yeah. you know, think of the people that Christmas come out to that. Christmas train's amazing, eh? Yeah, and, and when you have a, a jump-off point like that, to me, you should be able to build on that. Right. People come, so how can you build it and make right. it bigger? So, and, and that's no different than the festival. Right. But it still takes volunteers, so yeah. uh, hopefully we can yeah. get enough people are still yeah. ambitious enough to do that. Anyway, okay. that's, that's enough stories for today. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs>